Python is a fascinating language that contains a ton of hidden yet extremely useful and powerful features. In this video, I'll share with you five of them that you need to understand if you want to fully grasp the language and come across as a professional. Now, another way to come across as a professional is to join something like Course Careers Software Development Program. Not only do we teach you all of the essential skills, but we run you through in-depth career preparation. More on that later, now let's dive into the features. The first feature to look at here is the anonymous variable. Now this is simply the underscore, and this is used as a placeholder when you need to declare a variable, but you don't care about the value of that variable. So to give you a quick example, let's say we wanna do something 10 times. What we could probably do is just create a for loop and say for i in range, and then we can type this correctly and put 10, and we can do you know print and then do this. Okay, so this is valid, this will run, and we'll see do this 10 times. But notice here that we're not actually using the value of the variable i. It's not a huge problem, this code is still gonna run, but what we can do is replace this with an anonymous variable, which is simply the underscore. Now this code will work perfectly fine. Now why would we do this? Well, in some programs you actually have a linter or in some IDEs, and you'll get kind of squiggly lines under your unused variables telling you to use them. Some code bases won't actually allow you to even push code if you have any linting errors. And a lot of times it's just a little bit easier when you're not using a variable to simply use the underscore in place of it so that you don't get a syntax error and you don't have any confusion about what this variable is doing. Now, as well as using this in a for loop, we can use it in a lot of other situations. So here you see I have a coordinate. Now, what I might want to actually do is unpack this coordinate and just get maybe the X or Y value. So traditionally, I could do something like X comma Y is equal to my coordinate. X will now be equal to five and Y will be equal to 10. However, if I'm not going to use either of these values, what I can do is replace them with an underscore. Now I'm still able to unpack this because I have something where the Y value would go, but I don't need to declare a variable that I'm not gonna end up using. Now, same thing works if we're trying to unpack, say the larger coordinate. So if we copy this and paste this here, we could do something like X comma underscore comma Z. And now we're able to get the X and Z values, which we might need to use, but we don't need to have an unused variable for the value Y. Now, similarly, if we're doing something like a list comprehension, so let's do something like second elements. Let's say I just want to get the second value out of all of these different pairs in this list. Well, I can do this in a few different ways, but if I do a list comprehension, I can say second element equals B for underscore comma B in and then list of pairs. And now if we go ahead and print out the second elements and we run our code, you see that we get B, D and F and we didn't have to declare a variable A that we don't end up using. Now, believe it or not, this next feature I didn't learn about until I was writing Python code for over three years. Now, this is the else statement associated with a for or a while loop. Now, a lot of times when we're iterating over some type of structure, what we're trying to do is find if some criteria is true or if it's false. A lot of times we might be looking for an item or trying to see if the list satisfies some criteria. Now, if that's the case, we often want to do something with the list afterwards if it did or didn't satisfy that criteria. And that means we need to actually have some kind of flag that tells us how we exited the loop. What I mean by this is we could exit early because the criteria was true, or we could exit after we iterated through all of the different items. So let me give you a quick example to show you what I mean. In this instance, we have a while loop, we iterate over this list, and we try to see if the item B exists inside of the list. Now, if we didn't have this flag that I'm setting here, found equal to true, when we reach the end of this while loop here, we won't know why we exited. We could have exited because we broke out of the loop by finding the item, or because I became equal to the length of the items. So we need to include this flag here, and then we use the flag to do some type of operation. However, we actually don't need to include the flag because of this while else and for else syntax. So let's remove this flag and let me show you how we could write this alternatively. So rather than having if not found, we can simply just put the else statement here. Now this is completely valid syntax and what this will do is print out do something here if we don't exit the loop from a break statement. So let me just make this really clear. This else statement will run if we don't break out of the loop. Now this works for both for or while loops and we can look at a quick example here. So let's just do a print and just say found it and let's run the code and you'll see that we get found it. Now if I change this to something that's not in the list, so say the value Z and we rerun the code, you see that we get do something here. 
So the else statement will be triggered if you don't break out of the loop that it's associated with. Now we can easily switch this to a for loop as well. So we can just say for, and this will be item in items. We can remove this and we'll see the exact same thing works. If I run my code, we get do something here. So really some useful syntax, whatever you're trying to determine whether you broke out because you found some criteria and use the break keyword, or if you reach the very end of the list, then what you can do is use this else syntax. Now, before we get into this third feature, I do want to let you know that I recently teamed up with some of the top software development instructors online. For example, one of them is Web Dev Simplified. We've created literally the best course online to help you land a software development job. Not only do we teach you all of the skills you need and run you through in-depth specializations in your desired topics, so front-end, back-end, or DevOps, but we have a huge focus on your career, so setting you up with the best templates for your resume, interview prep, how you answer specific questions, what jobs to apply for, how to optimize your LinkedIn. We have literally everything in the course where the sole purpose is to help you land a job as quickly as possible. If you're interested, you can check it out from the link in the description. We've got a free introduction course and obviously a no obligation 14 day money back guarantee. So if you're not interested, you can of course just refund the course. No questions asked, no risk. We've already had a ton of success and I can't wait to see you guys there. So the next feature to show you is something known as the walrus operator. Now this was released in Python version 3.8, so make sure you're at minimum using that version. Now the walrus operator looks like this. It's a colon and an equal sign, and it allows you to actually define a value while using it as part of a condition. Really cool, and I'm gonna show you how we can use it to write more readable and clean code. So I actually have a fairly complex example in front of me that's using something known as a generator. Now you don't need to worry too much about how the generator works, but the idea here is that you see that this is looking a little bit messy. What I'm doing is I'm defining a generator object and I'm saying data is equal to the next value that my generator is gonna give me. So it's gonna yield me values and just keep giving me values until it runs out. Now what I say is while the data is not equal to negative one, which is the last value yielded, I'm gonna process this data and then I'm gonna get the next value. So this is something you might've seen before where you're continually getting some value, processing it, and then getting the next value, but you're actually using the result of that as part of the condition in the while loop. If this doesn't make sense, don't worry, I'm gonna show you a few other examples. So in this case, it works, but it's a little bit messy. So the way we can clean this up is the following. We can actually use the walrus operator. So I'm gonna put a set of parentheses. I'm gonna say data colon equal to the next value from our generator. And I'm gonna say, well, this does not equal negative one. Now what this allows me to do is remove both of these lines. And I'll just quickly show you that when I run the code, this works as my code worked before. So what exactly are we doing here? Well, what we're doing is saying, okay, I want some variable data. I need to use this variable later in my loop, but I also want the result of it to be a part of this condition in the while loop. So I say data colon equal to, this is the walrus operator, sorry, and then the next value from my generator. And then I take whatever the result of this is, and I say that does not equal to negative one. Now this allows me to use whatever the current value of data is inside of my loop without having to define it or reprocess it multiple times, as well as have it be a part of this condition. All right, so here's another quick example of where we could use the walrus operator to get some better and actually in this case, more efficient code. So let's imagine we have some function f of x. And let's say this is a pretty complicated function. It might actually take a fair amount of time to run and it performs some operation on some numeric input. Now, maybe what we wanna do is we wanna loop through all of the numbers from one to 10. We wanna pass them to this function and we wanna get the result of the function only if it gives us some certain criteria. So in this case, if the result is greater than three. Well, what I'm doing right now is I'm saying, okay, I'm gonna loop through the values from zero to nine and if, f with the value, so if we pass that value to f and it gives us something that's greater than three, then I actually wanna take whatever that result is and put that inside of my list. This is a list comprehension in Python, and what we're doing here is actually computing the same value two times. The reason we're doing that is because we have f of x called twice. So what we can actually do is clean this up using the walrus operator. Let me show you that example. So you can see now we have some equivalent code, but that's actually much more efficient and only calling the function one time. What we've done is said, okay, we're gonna use a variable result. So we're gonna say four X in range 10, if, and then we use the walrus operator. So we say result colon equal to f of x. We've now defined the result is equal to this computation or to this result. We check if it's greater than three. And if it is, we use whatever that result is to populate our list. 
This way we're only calling the function once. This is much more efficient. So moving on to feature number four, we have argument and parameter unpacking. This is super powerful and you're probably gonna see this syntax quite a bit, especially in more professional Python code. So let's have a look at this example here. Let's say we have some function that takes in four values, A, B, C, D. It could take in any number of values, but in this case it takes in four. And we have some list that has the corresponding values that we wanna pass into this function. So what we need to do if we wanna pass those values is access the first value, the second value, the third value, and the fourth value, we gotta write them all out. Now it's not a huge deal if we're just passing four or five values, whatever, but if we got to pass a bunch of them, it can be tedious and there's a better way to do this. What we can use, is something known as the asterisk or unpack operator. I can actually write asterisk LST, and you'll see that if I run this code, it operates as I'd expect. I get one, two, three, four. Now what this asterisk operator will do is what I said, it will unpack the values in an iterable object. So this doesn't just work for lists, it works for any type of object that's iterable. And what it will do is take all of the values and pass them as the corresponding positional arguments inside of this function. So it will pass one for A, two for B, three for C, four for D, etc. Now this will work if we did a tuple as well. So if we simply change this to a tuple, exact same thing will work. And if we change this to like a string, as long as it has the exact number of characters, let's not do that one, let's do uh, okay. <laughs> Oops, I was gonna do hello. You see that we get okay, A, Y. So anything that's iterable, this will work for. And just make sure that you have the correct number of values because if I do okay with two Ys, you'll see that we get an error here where it's trying to pass five positional arguments, but only four were listed. Now in the same way that that works, we can actually do this for keyword arguments as well, or for dictionaries. So you can see here that we have a dictionary. It contains key and target equal to five and 10. Now these are the corresponding parameter values that we have inside of our function. Now again, similarly to before, if we wanted to actually pass these values, we need to say values key, values target like that to pass them in. So if we run this, you see it works and we print out five and 10. Let's just clear this here. However, we can actually use a kind of double unpack or keyword unpack, whatever you want to call this, with the double asterisk operator on our dictionary. So we can say asterisk, asterisk, sorry, values. And what this will do is it will pass as keyword arguments, the key equal to the value. So what I can do is run this and you see that we get 510. And what's interesting, if I were to change the order around here and go target and key, this is still gonna work. We still get five and 10. Really what this code is equivalent to is taking whatever the key values are, so both key and target, writing those as keyword arguments and then making them equal to whatever their values are associated with. So when I do asterisk, asterisk value, it's as if I were out key equals five, and target equals 10, which works really well for keyword arguments. You just need to make sure the name of the keys match the name of the arguments that you have, or the name of the parameter, sorry, that you have inside your function. So just remember the single asterisk is when you're unpacking iterable objects, and the double asterisk is when you're unpacking a dictionary, and you're gonna be passing these as keyword arguments. So our final feature to go over here is something called the default dictionary. Now, before we look at that, let's look at a quick example of how we typically use a normal dictionary. So the key thing to keep in mind here is when you try to access a key that does not exist in a dictionary, you get an error. Now, there's a few ways to handle that with normal dictionaries, but it makes our code a little bit more messy and we have to handle a few different edge cases. So here we have some dictionary character count, and we're counting the frequency of all of the characters in the string. Pretty famous problem. So we loop through the string, and the first thing we need to do is check if the given character is not in the character count. So if it's not one of the existing keys. If it's not, we then assign its value to zero. So that way, when we go to access the key down here and increment it by one, we don't get an error. If I remove this line here and we run the code, you'll see that I get a key error A because I try to access a key that doesn't exist in the dictionary. So how can we get around this without having to have that syntax that I just showed you? Well, Python has a really interesting library called collections. What I can do is say from collections import the default dictionary. Now the default dictionary is what's known as a subclass of the normal dictionary that has some slightly different behavior story that allows us to automatically assign a default value when we access a key that doesn't yet exist. 
So we can write default dictionary here rather than the normal dictionary syntax. And what we need to pass to this is something known as the default factory. Now this is simply a function that returns what the default value should be. So I'm going to say define default. Okay. And then here I'm simply going to return zero and then I'm going to put defaults like this, but notice I don't call the function. I just write the function name. I know this is a bit strange, but what's required is that we pass some function that when called will return a value that will be the default value for the dictionary when a key does not exist. So what I can do now is run this code and you see we get the exact same results. So we have all of the characters counted and we don't get a key error like we had before. So just to really recap this here, this function is going to be called every single time we try to access a key that doesn't exist. So as we iterate through this string, we see the key A. When we see the key A, so we say char count at A plus equals one, we try to access the existing value to increment it by one, but it doesn't exist. So we call this default function, it returns the value zero, that becomes the default value, we then add one to that. We repeat the process, eventually we get to B. Same thing, we use zero as the default value and we keep going. Now, one thing to note, this default function does not take in any parameters. It simply returns whatever the default value should be. We could return a string, we could return a list, we can return really anything we want. It could be another dictionary, but you just need to put it inside a function, then put the name of the function that you want to be that default factory. So with that said, that's going to wrap up this video. If you enjoyed, make sure you leave a like and check out my channel for more Python videos like these ones.